Well, good morning and a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church and thank you for joining us. Since Groundhog Day, we've been reflecting on Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Back then in February, we had no idea the impact COVID-19 would have on us as a church and on the wider community. And I've been grateful, as I've mentioned previously, to numerous people. Uh, pretty well every week we've had suggestions and encouragement uh, to assist us with being online. This is the ninth Sunday, streaming uh, elements of our usual service. And if you want to know more about our usual service, you can find in our regular Sunday leaflet, uh, you can find a PDF of it on the church's website, www.blackburnpc.org.au. Each week it's there. There are sermon notes included in the leaflet, and if you want to follow up and even find an outline of previous sermons, they're all there. And the actual uh, clip that you're watching in, uh, in the Facebook uh, can be viewed in a YouTube format there as well. Please leave a comment to let us know you visited. And if you have any thoughts or questions or suggestions, please use the comments option on Facebook. Today... We're inviting you to join with us in the worship of God as we pray, listen to the Holy Scriptures, and reflect on them together, and as we seek to pursue the vision of God's purpose, God's pathway in our life as it's unfolded by the Lord Jesus. Again this week, we're privileged to have Amanda play for us, both violin and viola this week, and to provide short periods of reflection at the start and close of our service. So we shall enjoy the wonder of music. Let us begin then with a period of reflection as Amanda plays for us Fantasy by Telemann. Thank you, Amanda. Shall we join together in prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to connect with each other through the internet and uh, at your invitation, Lord Jesus, we come to our Heavenly Father in your name. And we ask that in this short time in which we are connected, you will speak to us 
about the things that matter. We want to thank you for our lives and we want to thank you that you love us and you care about our lives. So we pray that you would speak to us and that your spirit would lead us into the week in front of us, one day at a time. Hear us and help us, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we have a segment in, uh, in our service called Young at Heart. And today I've decided to talk about sniffer dogs. I don't know if you have had any experience with sniffer dogs, but some years ago on returning from overseas, Christine and I uh, arrived home at Tullamarine Airport in Melbourne and we were dutifully passing through immigration and border control when we were in fact just at the final check before you go through those doors into the public hall when I was asked to stand to one side and to open my backpack, uh, the same backpack as I used this morning as, as I came here with the gear in it, I was asked to stand aside, open my backpack, put it on a bench for inspection. And I was asked, did I have anything to declare? And uh, I had nothing to declare. Um, but this person and this dog seemed very interested in my backpack. So I duly opened it up and uh, it was, it's a great backpack. It has numerous uh, zip-up Hang on, I'll show you. So this is my backpack. And, and you can see that uh, it has a space here, especially for a computer. That's a zip-up compartment. It has another large zip-up compartment with pockets in it. It has a zip-up section here, which is uh, uh, waterproof. And it has another one here which is waterproof and you can put damp towel, wet swimmers in there. It has another one here with, with uh, uh, little pockets in it and uh, things you can hook a uh, key ring into so you won't misplace it. We went through all of these and then I realised that there are two other pockets on this. There's one here and one here. And this I think is a backpack intended for cold weather. But when you undo these two pockets you can put your hands into fleecy lined com compartments. And as I put my hand into these compartments, I realized that there was an apple here. And the dog had picked up that I was carrying fruit. So I had to apologize profusely. And uh, it wasn't a laughing matter then. And it's not really a laughing matter now, but it's just an amazing moment. Uh, uh, as I complied and did what I had been told and revealed what I was carrying, uh, the problem was that the beagle, I think it was a beagle, being interested in my backpack eventually resulted in me having to expose an apple that I had put there 10 days previously and forgotten all about. I don't normally use these little pockets on my backpack. And I had put my, ha my apple in there when I was out on a walk one time and forgotten all about it. Now, the amazing thing is that dogs can detect more than just apples and fruit. Drugs, cancer, currency, explosives, malaria, epilepsy, and many other things can be detected by dogs. Have a look at this. This is a new thing uh, from uh, Euronews this week. So using 
training methods that medical detection dogs, the UK charity, have developed. Uh, dogs can be trained. The dogs in mind are these six dogs that are the first in the series. Uh, they're all named. They're, some of them are rescue dogs. Uh, there's a strong element of uh, Cocker Spaniel there and, uh, and uh, Labrador dog as well. Labradoodle, I think, was one of them. So these dogs can be trained to uh, detect, they believe, the presence of COVID-19 because as a bacteria which affects our respiration, it affects body odour, the way we smell. You can't detect it, I can't detect it, but dogs can. And this alerts us, I think, to the very idea that there is an unseen reality which we can't see, but which dogs are aware of. And if we can de demonstrate this in a physical arena, when Jesus says to us, if I have spoken to you of earthly things, how can you believe, if you do not believe, how will you believe if I speak to you of heavenly things? So we tune into Jesus because he stands uh, tall in the arena of world history. His teachings have had profound effect on the entire globe. And we come to him to hear what he says because we believe like uh, Peter long ago, Lord, to whom else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. So as we turn to those words, we're going to hear uh, Sonia Rutherford, one of our members who's up the country at the moment, is going to bring us our Bible reading. It's from Matthew 7, verses 13 to 20. So we're getting close to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Here's Sonia. Good morning, Amen, and may God bless that reading to us this morning. So today we come uh, to Jesus' words at, that uh, Sonia has read, and we're going to go into this sensitive passage as carefully as we can. Uh, we're going to go beyond our experience of COVID to Jesus' warning about fake news. And... Uh, I sometimes see an ABC TV program called Media Watch. The presenter, Paul Barry, analyzes key media reports. Again and again, he uncovers misleading and poorly researched stories which are amplified by repetition in other media. How easy is it to get to the news? This is a, a billboard uh, in New York advertising the New York Times. The word they use is truth. And in case you can't see it, I've put it on the leaflet. The truth is hard to find. The truth is hard to know. The truth is hard to find. The truth is hard to hear. The truth is hard to believe. The truth is hard to accept. The truth is hard to deny. The truth is more important now than ever. And it's an ad for the New York Times. Uh, a newspaper which claims to research stories and, and present a full picture to its readers. So as we think about, about the idea of uh, 
the truth and fake news and false prophets, we, we uh, turn to this passage in the Sermon on the Mount. And I've put on the screen this image. This is a, an image of a Brazilian nurse. And she had spent a day working in the COVID uh, ward. And she, before she took off her gear, she took a photograph of herself, which she posted on Instagram. I took it off the BBC news site. What she was saying was, for the sake of your own health and for the sake of the whole community, stay at home. Uh, the president of Brazil took a different line. Professor Bolsonaro, president Bolsonaro was uh, seen uh, in crowded gatherings and waving to people, plenty of physical contact, not wearing a mask, no idea of, of social distancing, uh, flouting all the suggestions that have been made by experts in health and, uh, and medical research. And uh, as a result, the new epicenter we hear of the uh, coronavirus uh, a pandemic is South America. So it, it's, this virus is spreading and it's moving around the globe. So from the start, our government in Australia, by national cabinet, has deferred to medical and scientific opinion about COVID-19. They've laid aside ideological and political and economic concerns to focus on the health of the community. This has meant that fake news about the spread and containment of the virus has been minimized, and the result has benefited us all. There have been massively fewer coronavirus deaths than in some other jurisdictions where press freedom is denied or restricted or where false information is widely circulated. Now, coming back to Jesus' words, it was clear to Jesus that his way, the narrow way that Sonia alluded to, which was our theme last week, will be misrepresented. And we need to hear his warning. Fake news still proliferates. Let us see what we can glean from Matthew's report on this matter. I'm going to draw your attention to four things. Four things. Firstly, expect fake news. Jesus warns about it. Secondly, truth exists. This is the other side of the idea that there will be fake news. Truth does exist and we must uh, seek that and pursue it. And thirdly, there is a danger here that we miss the truth. So Jesus warns about the danger of missing out on this. Let's think, first of all, about expecting fake news. In the history of the Jewish people into which Jesus was born, it was a long history. Uh, they had the scriptures sp spreading out over a thousand years, and in those scriptures, there were true ideas and false ideas. The true ideas in the, Pen in the Pentateuch, for example, the first five books of the Old Testament, they were uh, the word of God to the people, and, and they were regarded as the books of Moses. Moses is the principal character and author of those books. And so we have the books of Moses. And after that, anything that was... Uh, the part of the ministry of a true prophet had to comply with that first searching question, did it fit with what Moses said? The first test of a true prophet was, did it fit with what Moses said? And the second test was, if this person claims to speak from God, it will happen. It will come true. So two simple tests, did it fit with the Torah and did it happen? And these questions arise throughout the whole of the Old Testament. And we could turn to multiple passages in the three divisions, divisions of the Hebrew Bible, the law, those first five books, the prophets, uh, and the writings, the wisdom literature and the Psalms and, and so on, which testify to uh, human testimony being authentic or inauthentic. This contest of ideas is presented through the Hebrew Scriptures, and false messengers are exposed, and sometimes the damage they create is laid bare. 
Earlier in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he had emphasized that the Old Testament writings have a normative role. They've not been nullified or swept away because of his presence. He came not to abolish them, but to bring them to fulfillment. That's why we have them as part of our Christian Bible. The Old Testament is published along with the New Testament. And it's all scripture. Like the false prophets in Israel, false prophet apostles would arise in the New Testament. And like the prophets, the false apostles... Uh, in falsehood usually offered easier and feel-good options. Now, false prophecy is pretty well aligned with what we call fake news. It's no longer the sole domain of major news media. In an age of social media, it's all too easy to transmit misinformation, by which we mean error, although we have multiple polite terms for it. There's nothing new here. The broad way has its spruikers. The narrow gate is harder to find. But we shouldn't let this detract us from the idea that truth does exist. It almost goes without saying that if there is a falsehood, then there is truth. In 1616, nutmeg was believed to protect people from bubonic plague. One shipload of nutmeg from the east from the Spice Islands, could make a man fabulously wealthy, the richest of men. And many people, especially the Dutch and the English, sought to win that trade. Now, we no longer live in a world that delivers a fortune to the nutmeg traders. Like them, we might be mistaken. And worse, we might even be manipulated. The banning of books, like the imprisonment of journalists, is a sign that someone is claiming a monopoly on truth. Freedom of the press and freedom of speech are critical ingredients in a democracy. When they're weakened, democracies are vulnerable. In a crisis, the truth matters more than ever. We need reliable information. Which voices know the situation and carry authority, we wonder? Who can we trust? Well, I've already referred to and suggested the wisdom of deferring to medical and scientific opinion in this matter. On the uh, floor of the State Parliament of Victoria, there is a large and beautiful mosaic, and it's from the Book of Proverbs. In the multitude of counsellors, there is safety. So we need to draw widely on the opinions that will speak to our situation. We're privileged to live in a world where there have been massive gains in public health and scientific knowledge. But here we're thinking about Jesus and about controlling much more than a virus. We're thinking about the complex entity that we call ourself. Jesus has spoken about his narrow way, where way is a metaphor that encompasses our approach to all of life. He set before us hearers truth that fits with Moses. Even in his day, he claimed enduring consistency with the scriptural vision of Israel's prophets. He quoted them again and again. His life synchronized with so much that was said by those uh, prophets of Israel. In him, we see that truth is made personal. His concern was for others ahead of himself. He fulfilled Israel's law of loving the Lord, the God of Israel, and loving his neighbor as himself. He was crucified as king of the Jews. Matthew tells us that toward the end of his gospel. And Matthew presents him as the long-awaited Messiah. See the very first chapter of Matthew's gospel, the Son of God. And in John's gospel, Jesus claims to be the truth. Does it matter? Well, Jesus says, yes, there is a danger if we ignore what's true. Jesus' words are a warning. There is mortal danger. And the images he uses, as you heard Sonia reading them, are very vivid. They're like wolves among a flock of sheep. There's a very real danger of mayhem and death. 
when we first came to Australia in 1972, we uh, had good friends who uh, run a sheep farm. And I remember she Keith, the, uh, the farmer, telling us that uh, when dogs get among sheep, they cause terrible, terrible injuries and death. And uh, I've never know, known wolves among sheep, but the image is vis vis vivid and has stayed and become a, uh, a byword almost, uh, wolves among sheep. So there's a real danger of mayhem and death. And like trees with diseased fruit, there's a danger of hunger and of unfruitfulness in our lives. Jesus is alerting us as individuals and as a community that not healing but a destructive legacy of sorrow and loss is possible. Progress is not automatic. Civilizations can go backward. Where people once flourished, there may become a bleak and barren landscape. Where people once shared a common wealth, there may come poverty and loss. The mortal danger to which Jesus is referring is both moral and doctrinal. It's a question of propositional correctness. From Jesus' sermon in particular, but also from the whole Bible, we notice two related areas, and they're well expressed by John Stott. I think everything John Stott expresses is well expressed. He says, The first kind of fruit by which false prophets reveal their true identity is in the realm of character and conduct. In Jesus' own allegory of the vine, fruitfulness evidently means Christ-likeness. In fact, what Paul later termed the fruit of the Spirit. So love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit. But Stott continues, a, a second fruit is the person's actual teaching. This is strongly suggested by the other use Jesus made of the same fruit tree metaphor in Matthew chapter 12. So then, if a person's heart is revealed by his words, as a tree is known by its fruit, we have a responsibility to test a teacher by his teaching. Just thinking how this might apply, last year I was in a supermarket choosing asparagus. All fresh produce, I have been informed, is A grade. Yet as I watched a person choosing which bunch of asparagus to select, it was clear she found it extremely difficult. She handled about a dozen different bunches before deciding which one or two to take. She was searching for the very best among the A-grade asparagus. Now, not just with asparagus, but with all manner of large decisions, Jesus says it matters. Our decisions matter. Our choices matter. Do the advertisements draw us along, inviting us to be the center of our own worldview? For the most important person in the world, you, have you heard that ad? Again and again we are uh, fated in advertising. Do we assess what we hear and read? Will we listen to Jesus and see through the lens he has provided? Will we live in step with his spirit? Are we as concerned about the morality of our choices as we should be? Do we put people ahead of prosperity? We must provide for our families. Can we be generous as well? How does concern for the outcast and stranger show in our lives? Will we even entertain the idea of having love for our enemies? Are we prey to fake news and false prophets? We need to ask ourselves, how much does the voice of Jesus shape my choices? Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we confess that we are easily drawn aside from the narrow way of Jesus, your Son, and our Lord. Please forgive us that we easily give credence to fake news and the persuasive voices that encourage indulgence, waste, 
and indolence. Bring to each of us the deep cleaning of forgiveness which Jesus accomplished for our salvation at Calvary. Lead us by your Holy Spirit from the vain striving for this world's glory into the way of joy, life and peace. Thank you today that our community as a whole has borne well the weeks of isolation and that the threat of COVID-19 has been significantly contained. As the restrictions are eased across our states, may we all stay sensitive to those practices which promote personal hygiene and community health. With the changes in restrictions, we especially ask that community transmission will be curtailed, school children and teachers protected, and public transport and usually congested areas kept clean and safe. We pray that in nursing homes and retirement villages, where our most vulnerable live, all necessary steps will be taken to preserve health and well-being. Grant comfort where there has been loss and where bereavement has brought distress. We ask that as new global, a new global epicenter of the coronavirus pandemic has opened up in South America, you will help people to get sound advice and that fake news will be shut down. Please bring medical help to the poor and most vulnerable to coronavirus in the vast cities of South America, Africa and East Asia. And in the war zones of the world, bring warmongers to justice and peace to broken bodies and aching hearts. Please help us to remember and carry forward the things we have learned in solitude and the benefits which enrich our families with harmonious, creative, enjoyable and productive routines. We ask that you will speak calm and reassurance to families feeling frustration, sadness and anger because of reduced circumstances and encourage those where working from home remains complicated by homeschooling and by the fear that normal will be very different from before. May the voice of Jesus reach us in the busyness of each day, helping us again to love one another as you have loved us. Unite us, Lord, as we pray together in the words you have taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now Amanda is going to play for us a closing reflective piece. It's Fares After a Dream. Thank you, Amanda.
Thank you, Amanda. It was truly beautiful. Far eyes after a dream. Let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, our prayer is that our hopes and prayers and dreams will be filled with Jesus, who himself is the truth, who has led us in the narrow way, the way of life and joy and peace. Lead us in that path this week. Guide and bless us as we seek your hand upon all those we love. Protect us from fake news and falsehood and keep us safe for your name's sake. And so may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us and with those whom we love now and always.